Excelsior, true believers! You are about to embark upon a journey, a trip to the 70s and 80s, when mighty Marvel Comics ruled over all. The Defenders, Doctor Strange, the Champions, Deathlock, the Submariner, the Incredible Hulk, Killraven, the Son of Satan, the Macabre Man-Thing, and all your other Bronze Age favorites every week, appearing on Defenders Dialogue. Now, here are your guides, Christopher Golden and Brian Keane. Excelsior, true believers. Excelsior, indeed, and welcome back once again to Defenders Dialogue. I'm Brian Keane. And I am Christopher Golden. And Brian, it's the final episode about the Bronze Age Man-Thing by Steve Gerber. Um, And in a weird way, I feel like it contains, for me, the best and worst of Gerber's habits as a writer. Absolutely. Uh, You know, listeners to this show are, are no stranger to my absolute adoration and, and worship of Steve Gerber, the writer. Uh, but the man was not without his flaws, particularly when he was overwhelmed with deadlines. Uh, and I think that is on clear display in these final two and a half issues. Mm-hmm. Uh, we pick up, of course, last week, Chris surprised everybody in the listening audience by stopping halfway through issue 20 and ending us on a cliffhanger. Well, issue 20 is set up. Um, in chapters, much the way that the giant size issues were set up. So I stopped at the end of chapter one because I felt like we were about to tell the story that leads into the rest of it. Um, yes. So, so just I think to recap, uh, for those who are who need recapping, uh, the man thing and Richard Rory uh, and Richard Rory's unintended kidnap victim <laughs> underage kidnap. underage on a, a, a young woman who's run away with richard rory without richard rory n- realizing that she's not quite 18 yet uh and he's taken her across state lines and thus is uh is liable to be charged with kidnapping if anybody discovers it and as we said last week really he should have immediately put her back in a vehicle and taken her back to florida and so and, and then you know left her across state lines. <laughs> but um, Man Thing and Richard Rory were just in a car accident with a vehicle driven by a demon in service of Thog. Yep. And from that, uh, that demon was a courier driving this vehicle. It crashed and a thing called a nightmare box spilled out That's and right. is in the hands of Richard Rory and Man Thing as chapter two begins. Chapter two is called Danny's Eyes. And interestingly, Brian, this little piece of this issue is one of the things I remembered. If you recall, I said that this was one of the issues that I did read. And I remembered that piece and another piece that's coming up um, very clearly. Uh, in fact, this and the previous issue may be the only issues of band thing that I ever read growing up. Yeah. I, uh, I have mixed feelings about this. I had mixed feelings about it as a child, uh, for, for chapter three, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, but as an adult rereading this, I, I have mixed feelings about chapter two as well. Um, we'll, we'll see what you think about it, but yeah, it's, uh, it's told from the journal of someone named Paul Jennings. And he's talking about this woman named Danny, D-A-N-I, and how her eyes seem to change color depending on what she's saying and how she feels about it. And we have some great artwork and ink work here. Uh, The the eyes go from brown to green to blue. Um, And supposedly these, these eye color changes are connected to Danny's aura. Well, that's according to a model named Sage, who uh, who is romantically interested in Paul Jennings, uh, but Paul only has eyes, no pun intended, for Danny, who is his editor. So he is painting a painting of the man thing for the cover of the Sunday supplement in the local newspaper. Um, 
the cover. Did I say color? The cover of the Sunday supplement. Um, and, you know, there's a conversation. We don't need to belabor it between the two of them. But I quite enjoyed that scene. Paul goes in to bring his painting uh, to Danny. And he asks her about the color of her eyes. Um, she sort of blows it off. Um, and he goes out to get his paycheck. But changes his mind, Brian. And re-enters. And then... Yeah, when he when he re-enters the studio, uh, Danny is there, um, and she's looking at the painting, and you know she thinks the man thing looks so pitiful and so strong all at once. Uh, but then Paul asks her. He says, "I've been trying to remember what color are your eyes. Every time I look, they're different." And uh, she says, "Well, they're hazel, of course." She denies that there's anything different about her eyes. Uh, he leaves, and when he comes back in again, Chris, what happens? Well, when he comes back in again, he finds that Danny has one of, we find out there's more than one nightmare box, in her hands. And she's looking down at it, and some pulses of light are beaming from her eyes uh, and basically being absorbed by the nightmare box. Yep. Uh, when... She finishes this. She realizes that he's been watching her. Uh, she, you know, she reams him out for interfere, inter, intruding on her privacy and sends him packing uh, with a threat, basically never to cross her threshold again. And uh, he finds himself ashamed and worried. He's a, he's a little bit afraid and he doesn't know why. Uh, there's a water main break that uh, that bursts up from the street uh, that we learn from his narration it lands him in the hospital. But he survives. He's OK. That's right. <clears throat> the same might not be able to be said of our title character, the man thing uh, in a different part of Atlanta. Uh, he is alone now without Richard Rory. In fact, the caption tells us uh, that uh, the, the local headlines say Florida kidnapped victim found in Atlanta abductor in custody. Uh, so Richard Rory is in jail since we last saw him. And, uh, and no, I mean, clearly this is Gerber has decided when he's going to stop working on man thing and he's hurrying now. And that's my huge problem with these right. three issues. Uh, it, it's so compacted. What should have been easily four or five, maybe even six issues is compacted into two and a half here. Uh, so, yeah, Carol Selby, who became a major character written off in a caption box. Apparently she's back home with the mad Viking and her book burning mother. And uh, Richard Rory, who five pages earlier was with the man thing with the nightmare box. Yeah. Also written off in that same caption. Yep. Now in jail. Uh, of course we know we see Richard again, both in the pages of the defenders and Omega and elsewhere. Uh, but yeah, the man thing is just wandering around the alleys of Atlanta Clutching the nightmare box, he, do, he doesn't know what to do with it, where to go. Uh, and then suddenly, and this is the part that pissed me off as a kid, uh, he sees his friends. He sees not only Carol and Richard, uh, but Korak the Barbarian and Jennifer Kale the Sorceress uh, and other friends who he's met in the Marvel Universe. Spider-Man, Shang-Chi, the master of Kung Fu. Ben Grimm, the ever-loving blue-eyed thing, and of course, Matt Murdock, Daredevil. The only one missing here is Kazar. He had also encountered Kazar by this point, uh, but he's not here. But he's they all they all appear in the alley, and they tell him, hey, you know, the box doesn't belong to you, buddy. It, it belongs to Thog, who we all serve. So, you know, how about you give it to us? Yeah, so these are Thog's demons uh, in disguise as friendly faces, and the man thing recognizes them as friendly faces, but he senses uh, that they are anything but. He says they feel like, or the narration says they feel like a quartet of vipers belched up from the blackest pits of hell. Man uh, thing had, had better sense than eight year old Brian, because eight year old Brian saw the promise of the cover to issue 20. Holy shit. The Thing, Spidey, Daredevil, Shang-Chi, and Jennifer Kale, who eight-year-old Brian thought was the bee's knees, and not for nothing, 53-year-old Brian still thinks the same. <laughs> and, and well, you then, have to blame, you can't blame Gerber for that, though. You blame Len Wein. 
because oh yeah i fully blame Len Lee. yeah Len was the editor and the cover was i think probably his responsibility and he did what marketing would want him to do when oh. the series is clearly running out of gas probably on the newsstand uh let's put a whole bunch of marvel you know superheroes on the cover and to be honest brian one of the reasons why I'm so excited to go back and, and be working on Marvel Team Up and Marvel 2 and 1 is because I want a variety of Marvel characters to talk about. I want to talk about the obscure characters from the Bronze Age, you know, and all that stuff. So, in, in, anyway, continue. Brian, yeah, little, man little thing, Brian was upset. Big Brian is still upset about it. Yeah, Man Thing makes short work of the demons, and, and the demons revert back to their demon form. They don't need their. They're human guises anymore. Uh, and while they're fighting Man-Thing, they realize that someone else is stealing the box. Uh, right. And they take off after it as Atlanta becomes quite quite literally hell on Earth. Much like uh, Defenders issues 99 and 100 uh, jam. Oh, I thought you say much like Dragon Con Weekend. But- or much like Dragon Con Weekend. <laughs> I was... I was going to say much like Jam DiMatteis's uh, six-fingered hand storyline in the Defenders, which involved the Man Thing and involved Thog, uh, yeah. but and the Nexus of all realities and the Nexus of all realities. But yeah, that takes us. Uh, so an, an, an unseen figure, we see only the hands grabs the Nightmare Box, and then chaos erupts in Atlanta, and we move on to issue twenty-one, That's uh, right. written by Gerber, again drawn by Jim Mooney. Um, a great, great art by Mooney, by the way, on these. Oh issues. yes, absolutely love his work on these issues. Yeah. And uh, the cover uh, has the scavenger, right? Yep. Um, and uh, this issue is called "A Lunatic on Every Corner." We pick up where we left off. Now I feel like so much of this is just chaos. So much of it is like Gerber's, like I know. Let me just have this turn into like a free for all. So. The the demons are there in the street. The police are shooting at them. There's a police helicopter. The man thing is there in the middle of the street. The police are shooting at him. The man thing grabs hold of a helicopter, which and and, and holds on for a while until he's forced to let go, and he falls down into uh, the trees on the outskirts of Atlanta. Who knows where? <laughs> um, and then we cut back to a guy named Roland and his wife. Elsbeth. Yes. Brian, I'm just going to sum up by saying Roland apparently is an accountant in serve. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm not going to be, I'm going to be clear here because I don't want to dance around it because then I don't want to explain it later. Roland is an accountant who is working for Thog. He's employed by Thog because there are a bunch of these nightmare boxes collecting all of this pain and misery and emotion from people that's going to power Thog uh, in his in his uh, his gambit to basically take over the universe. Um, these are the collectors of, yes. of that power. And Roland's job as an accountant is to make sure all the people providing that are are giving Thog his 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 just due or whatever. I mean, he's tallying up pain and misery, basically. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so Elspeth, you know, tired of being ignored by Roland, her husband, she goes outside uh, where she sees the man thing rising from where he fell from the helicopter. Um, and she feels almost giddy. Uh, she wants to race towards the beast. Uh, you know, she realizes it's it's the unpredictability of him. You know, he he's excitement. He's adventure. He's everything. Roland is not. Uh, so the two of them are looking at each other, but before anything else can happen, the scavenger returns to the pages of Man Thing uh, with his usual stick. He stick. He leaps at Elspeth, saying, "You are mine. I must have you. I must take you." Thog said, "I can have you." Yeah. He said he'd reward me for devouring you. So uh, I will say that uh, um, I was wrong. I, I meant to say so. It was issue twenty. 19, 20, and 21, I definitely read. And 22 is the one I didn't read because, boy, I would have remembered that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so interestingly for me in, in here is that uh, I 
after finishing reading this, I went and looked up Scavenger because, as we'll get to in a second, his story doesn't end. He right. just vanishes from the pages of Man Thing without any kind of ending. Right. Uh, however, uh, when I was reading about him, it, apparently he is the brother of Danny, the editor of the newspaper. Yes. Uh, and uh, he's gathering up much of this experience, everything he's soaking in from these women, which we'll get to in a second. But let me just say, Brian, and then you can take it and talk about this. This is maybe the most fucked up thing in a Marvel comic that was <laughs> consumed by children, maybe in this whole era. <laughs> no, I mean, this next sequence of five or six pages is so fucked up. Am I wrong about that? No, you, you're right. It's definitely up there. It's definitely up there. I mean, I think we can – basically what's going on here is – the scavenger, and again, I remember this so clearly, but I didn't remember any context for it. So this guy was born without the ability to feel, which, of course, is impossible because you wouldn't be able to walk or any of those things. But he has no sense of touch. Uh, so he was constantly burning himself, et cetera, et cetera. And he has a, a healing factor worthy of Wolverine. Oh, yes. So – as a kid, he would burn himself, cut himself, stab himself, whatever would happen, and he would heal and he'd be fine. And he grew up to be very attractive and women liked him, but he couldn't even feel it when he kissed them. Yep. Um, so basically, like he had no interest in sex because he couldn't feel anything, which somehow means that when he gets approached by Thog, when he gets older and Thog gives him the ability to feel essentially only while he is raping and murdering and draining all of the emotion and life out of a woman's body uh, until there's nothing left of her but bones. Yeah, he's then, a psychic rapist. Yeah, so he can feel all of that. Um, and we get his the recap of that story of his, um, and we leave off. And I didn't remember the context of this at all. All I remembered was, him clawing at his face to show that he couldn't feel pain. Right. Um, and then we end with him after having, you know, psychically raped Elsbeth with him lying satisfied on a mattress, uh, cradling her skeleton. Yes. Uh, that is some fucked up shit. That is some fucked up shit. Uh, yeah. For like, it, you know, for little kid Brian and little kid Chris, that was messed up. It's definitely up there. Uh, honestly, I think a lot of the impact of that flew right over my head as a kid. Me too. Um, you know, but but yeah, going back and rereading this as an adult, yeah, there it's. I'm always reminded of my oldest son, uh, who we don't talk about on this show. He's he's now 30 this year. Uh, and he, as as a as a kid, he was a huge fan of Peter David's run on the Hulk. Right. Um, and there was that storyline where uh, Banner's brain got separated from the Hulk, and, and Banner's brain went with all the other heroes to the the what they call it, the Heroes Reborn, the Onslaught Universe, whatever that was. And, and you had this uh, this monstrous Hulk running around in the Marvel universe and, and he lands on the white house lawn and he tells uh, Bill Clinton from now on, anytime you attack me, you lose a city. And when the army then attacks him, the Hulk uh, trashes an airplane out of the sky with people on board. And a lot of people forget about that, but it happened. Uh, and I remember my oldest boy as a kid reading this and it traumatized him. And it was it was really an object lesson for me about how, you know, e even though we read these as kids, there was stuff like that that went over our heads. And you assume stuff like that will go over your own kid's head, but it, it doesn't necessarily. Right, you know? yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, kudos to Gerber for this and kudos to Peter David for that scene as well. Um, but, yeah, yeah it, I, it's it's some grim, fucked up stuff. Yeah, it's <laughs> deeply messed up. It's also the last moment that this story makes any sense whatsoever. That's right. Uh, <laughs> now, go ahead because you take you take this and you explain this. All right. Now, 
If you're a regular listener, then you've heard our coverage of Giant Size Man Thing number three, and you will remember Clonus the Wizard and his barbarian sidekick Mortak. They're kind of the arch enemies, not only of the Man Thing, but of Dekim and Korak the Barbarian. Now, when last we saw them, Dekim, Korak, and Jennifer Kale had defeated them and well, put them in these Kim weird golden. In the Do what? Dekim had died in the process. That's right. Yeah. And and they had put them in these weird golden cocoons. Well, those weird golden cocoons land at the man thing's feet and out wait, hatch. Wait, 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 wait. They don't just land at the man thing's feet. <laughs> they are randomly hurled into the story by Steve Gerber. <laughs> there is absolutely no reason for these things to show up. <laughs> it's just like Steve Gerber knows he's wrapping up. He needs some more shit to happen in this in this issue. And he needs some more people for, for the man thing to fight. And he's like, oh, you know, we I didn't deal with those guys. I'll just throw the – I'll just have <laughs> these cocoons. No explanation whatsoever why they appear other than they were servants of Thog. <laughs> they land in, a, in the middle of some kind of junkyard as the man thing is shambling through. And they erupt from their cocoons and launch into battle against the man thing. And then the next thing that happens – also is completely inexplicable based on everything Steve Gerber has told us about the man thing up to this point is that Clonus's sorcerous fire cuts through the monster's head like a torch through oily, soft margarine, bursting open the creature's brow, unleashing a sickening flow of thick, black, foul-smelling gum, the substance which had for four years deadened the mind of Ted Salas. So now suddenly he's telling us that this gunk in the brow of the man thing is the reason that Ted Salas' mind is not functional, which is completely in the face of everything he's told us up to this point. But the thing that infuriates me, Brian, which will, is that he does this for no reason. Right. <laughs> he awakens the mind of Ted Salas and then doesn't use that in the story at all. Right. Right. Uh, but it does provide a distraction for the main villain himself to make an appearance. Thog, the nether spawn, returns on the final page, and uh, he promises that this time he will defeat the Man-Thing and become Lord of the Cosmos, which leads us in to our final issue, issue number 22. And, and I have to say that it's the final issue. It's called Pop Goes the Cosmos, also written by Gerber with art by Jim Mooney. And uh, I mean, <laughs> instead of even finishing the story, he started in stories, the multiple things happening in the previous few issues. I mean, he does wrap it up, but he wraps it up in such a, uh, in such a weird way. It's not like the end of the comic book story. It's like its own meta thing that uh, had I read this as a kid, I would have been like, what even is this? And this is the last issue. What is wrong with you people? <laughs> I, I read this as a kid um, and it, it confused the hell out of me. I can't uh, imagine but, why. <laughs> but but you must remember, even at that young age, you know, I connected Steve Gerber's name with. This is a job someone can have. This is what I want to do. So without spoilers, folks, what we get into here is metafiction. Steve Gerber himself. No, we're going to spoil it. We're going to tell them the story. Well, yeah. yeah, Steve Steve Gerber himself is the main character in this issue. So, yeah, and I was eight, as well. yeah, I was eight or nine when I read this and it was weird and it was bizarre, but it was also kind of cool. You know, I didn't have the Internet, so I, I didn't know anything about Steve Gerber other than he was writing Defenders and. And man thing. But so this was kind of neat. Um, of course, as an adult, you know, uh, you have metafiction everywhere. Hunter S. Thompson's entire career was based on it. Uh, on the other hand, you have uh, Stephen King writing himself into the Dark Tower. A lot of people did not enjoy that. I I, I enjoyed it very much. I loved it. I yeah. loved it. Um, well, let's let's read. I just want to read the, the, the three captions on the first page here. We we see. Steve Gerber himself sitting on the floor of his uh, messed up apartment, 
um, scribbling in a notebook. And what he's writing is, Dear Len, to Len Wein, the editor, as you know, I've been chronicling the exploits of the macabre man thing for almost three years now, some 36 stories in all. I've reported, oh, I've reported. But this one, the 37th, will be my last, and I feel I owe you an explanation why. To put it bluntly, I'm becoming too personally involved. I mean, dedication is one thing. Placing my life in jeopardy is quite another. But look, maybe I better begin at the beginning. And he proceeds to dramatize the events of uh, when he first got a call from Marvel to write Man-Thing. Um, and to Kim the Sorcerer appears to him in his real life to tell him that he's got to be the chronicler of the man things exploits. Uh, the whole thing is an attempt by De Kim to hold Thog back. That's right. Uh, we then get a, a multi-page recap of not only man thing, but adventure into fear, uh, including, you know, fear 11 with his very first battle with Thog, uh, fear number 12, which we talked about. It's, it's social impact. Uh, you know, we go through, we see the, the, the guys from F.A. Schist, we see Wondar, uh, we see Fool Killer, Howard the Duck, uh, you know, all the way up to, you know, our, our fascist book burners in the Viking. We, we get a, you know, a recap of everything. Um, Leading up to Giant Size Man Thing number three. Right. Where Dekim dies. And it is at that moment. So basically, Thog had been trapped on a world or in a dimension that was constant sunlight. And that kept his powers at bay. And in the moment to Kim dies, there's a flicker of a moment where there is an eclipse. Uh, and in that merest moment, the sun blinked out and he was as he was lost. And in that single heartbeat, Thog created a dimensional portal and escaped. And uh, now he intends to basically be, uh, you know, to, to take over everything, the universe, the multiverse, your nightmares. He created all the nightmare boxes to gather these things to basically as batteries to power his uh, uh, his attempts to do this. And we're still getting just like all recaps of all of this stuff. That's um, right. Um, basically, he's decided that he's going to take down the man thing, the guardian of the nexus of all realities, not with sorcery, but with emotion. Uh, and the nightmare boxes are tied into that plan. Uh, you know, the, the boxes are containers for emotional energy. Um, and what he needs is a, is, uh, you know, a, he, he needs a being who functions without emotion, uh, to put this plan into place. Um, and he finds that, uh, two, such beings are members of the same family. Uh, Danny, who, as Chris told you earlier, turns out to be the sister of the scavenger. Yeah. Yeah. And so basically he's using them as a uh, as a team of like to absorb and then deposit this emotional energy. Um, you know, again, it, these things are basically the batteries and all was going according to plan until. Uh, one of the, until the accident where the demon courier crashed into man thing in Richard Rory and, uh, the nightmare box was spilled back in issue 20. Um, and they picked it up. The man thing has sort of had it since then. Or, and then it was taken off the street in the middle of the chaos in Atlanta. Uh, and then a mysterious figure showed up at Steve Gerber's door and handed him the nightmare box. That's right. Uh, um. And now one one thing I do like about this, because we said this this final issue has both Gerber's best writing ticks and his worst writing ticks. Uh, one of the things I've always loved is when he switches from comic to prose in the middle of the comic book. Uh, and, and we get that here. It's a really neat transition. And then it transitions back to. Comic. Well, let me ask you, though, Brian, who is this guy? who comes to the door, clearly the person who had picked up the nightmare box on the streets of Atlanta and then shows up in New York at Steve Gerber's door with said nightmare box. He describes him as, uh, there he stood nightmare box in his hands, baseball cap on his head. The brim of that cap hit his face from me. And the rest of him is almost too ridiculous to describe a sweatshirt, a pair of jeans, tennis shoes, a cape fashioned from an old towel. 
I mean, I took it to be uh, just one of Thog's couriers, um, but I don't, I don't know. It, it's, it never tells us, and that's one of the frustrating things about this. There yeah. are so many loose plot lines left dangling here. Yeah, I, I, I'm, uh, yeah, I have no idea who that is. It felt to me like it wasn't, because why would Thog's courier bring it to Gerber, who is their enemy, because he's working for Dekim. Right. Um, by the way, De Kim is still advising him in a uh, Obi Wan Kenobi uh, disembodied fashion, astral yes. fashion. Um, so anyway, whoever, never, whoever that, the person is, yeah, it's uh, never explained. Yeah, but whoever it is, uh, the demons have followed him to Gerber's apartment, and then the 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 fictional demons from Marvel Comics attack real world Steve Gerber's apartment, uh, right. trying to get their hands on the box. Yeah. Um, then it just gets weirder. They're in, you know, a, a limbo dimension and, uh, Thog takes the box, um, and he's carrying it to the top of his pyramid. It's going to be, it's a pyramid of such boxes. And this is the last one that needs to be put in place for his plans to come to fruition. Um, it's awful MacGuffin, but, uh, there you have it. Um, and, you know, he's putting it in place and essentially uh, we get a double page spread with pros on either side um, of Man-Thing fighting Thog. Um, all of existence is essentially destroyed except for Steve Gerber, <laughs> Dekim, Thog and Man-Thing. That's right. So Steve Gerber and Dekim are watching as Thog and Man-Thing battle it out. Right. Now we get a gorgeous double page spread here by Jim Mooney. Yeah. Uh, basically the history of the Marvel universe. You see everybody from Thor and Conan, the barbarian to the human torch and the incredible Hulk. I mean, it, it's, it's fantastic to look at, uh, you know, detailing this, this battle across time and space. Um, eventually though, of course, Thog feels fear and, Chris, I'm going to let you say it for the last time. Uh, what, is, what does that mean? Well, you know, Brian, whatever knows fear burns at the man-thing's touch. That's right. Um, so, yeah, all of this is leading up to Thog and the man-thing fighting. Thog gets a little anxious that he might lose, and thus he's afraid, and thus he burns up to nothing. And literally, it's hard for me to say this because it seems like so wrong but that panel of thog burning up leaves us with only six panels left to this story um and they're uh they're steve gerber wrapping up writing this story in his journal or on his notebook and then at the door are de kim and man thing yes and they come in the, de kim and man thing enter steve gerber's apartment uh, and Gerber says, um, I suppose, you know, I'm giving it up the man thing book. I mean, um, and to Kim knows, he says, uh, it's no, I'm not going to try to talk you out of it. Um, and to Kim says, but we wanted to, uh, wish you, uh, we wish to express our appreciation for all you have done. Mayhap our paths will cross again someday. And Gerber says, yes, someday, I guess is this good. This is goodbye. And the last panel is a note from Gerber. Uh, finishing up his letter to Len Wein. Uh, he says, that was it, Len. Dakeem shook my hand. Man thing just stared at me like, I've, like I'd abandoned him, damn it. And they vanished in a wisp of smoke. Now it's time for me to do likewise. It's been fun, honest. I'll miss it. But I really can't go on. It says here, take care. <laughs> see you soon. Signed, Steve Gerber. And all I could think, Brian, was, I thought about what it must have been like for Len Wein to get this script in the mail. <laughs> like to no. read it and go and call him up and say, Steve, is this really the script or are you punking me? Is like there is another script on the way. What I'm curious about, uh, and, and remember listeners next week, we're going to do Legion of monsters. And after that, we're going to do uh, Marvel team up and Marvel two and one, but eventually we will get around to Man Thing's second Bronze Age series from the 80s, uh, written by Chris Claremont. Only runs 11 issues. But the reason I'm bringing that up now, Claremont clearly must have read this issue because 
he ends his man thing run with the exact same thing. Oh, but, okay. but in my opinion, does it way better than Gerber does here? Okay. Uh, it, it's the same conceit. DeKim has comes to him and it turns out Claremont's been chronicling the man things adventures. Uh, and he actually ends up bringing Louise Simonson and Jim Shooter and a bunch of other Marvel characters into it as well. Okay. Uh, so this is a pattern we see repeated. J.M. DeMatteis's Man Thing from the 90s, uh, I don't think the last issue had this. Uh, but yeah, as weird and bizarre as this issue is, obviously it's it's iconic and, and left an imprint on creators of the time because you see this device used occasionally in comics going yeah. forward. Well, it I think probably because people looked at the audacity of Gerber's Sayonara here. You know, yeah. I mean, it's like, <laughs> I don't know, man. I just was like, I, I think it was a uh, less than satisfactory way to go out for me. Yeah. As a fan, as a reader, absolutely. It's a less than satisfactory way to go out as a creator and a writer. It's, it's, some audacious art and, you know, hats off to Steve Gerber for having the balls to try it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it was. Yeah. <laughs> well, listen, I'm, I am, uh, overall, I'm really glad we did this. I really enjoyed covering the man thing, especially like we talked about how you hadn't read the champions before we covered the champions. I hadn't read man thing before we did this. So I'm really glad, uh, that we did it. I, I sort of wish that the uh, issues of sca issues with Scavenger had remained only a memory for me because I was a much more innocent person before I read <laughs> this version of that um, as an adult. But but so there you, have you said you read up on Scavenger. What happens to him after this? Because I don't remember him showing up in Marvel again. Um, he only showed up, if I'm correct, from looking at uh, the entry that I read, um, and I only sort of scanned it. Uh, he showed up again in a Wolverine miniseries huh. called uh, Wolverine, The Best There Is, I think. Um, and my assumption would be that he showed up because he has that healing factor but now I am curious. I have never read that miniseries. Now I am curious about finding that miniseries because it's like, well, how do you sanitize that character for modern comics? You know? <laughs> um, but yeah. Yeah. Wow. Very interesting stuff. Wow. Well, Donnie Cates, I know uh, you're about the only one left at Marvel that still listens to us regularly because – all our other regular listeners who used to write for Marvel no, are no longer at Marvel. Uh, <laughs> but, Donnie, you're still there. The scavenger is yours, man. You, you need to pick up the ball and run with it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, try to work that into 2021. I mean, it's, uh, you know, wow. All right. You know what else makes me say wow, Chris? Matt Wildeson. Matt Wildeson's The Demon in the Glass. Uh, new novel by Matt. Uh, it is on sale right now in on Amazon uh, in paperback, not available as an ebook, only as a paperback. Uh, of course, uh, if you don't know who Matt is, not only is he a, a great author, uh, but he's the guy that makes Chris and I sound good every week. He's the engineer for Defenders Dialogue and for some other podcasts as well. Um, so, yeah, head on over to Amazon. Uh, and check out The Demon in the Glass by Matt Wilderson. Uh Simply buying a copy of that book supports Matt, which supports this show. Uh, this show comes to you commercial free, so we appreciate you doing that. You know, Absolutely. sort him out. Absolutely. Um, next uh, week, folks, Chris, what do we have next week? What should they be reading? We are going to do the two issues of Marvel Comics that were actually labeled Legion of Monsters. Uh, one of them is Marvel Preview number eight, and the other one is Marvel Premiere number 28. Um, and Legion of Monsters, Brian, will be will be giddy boys next week when we're covering right. that. It's Morbius, the Living Vampire, Ghost Rider, Werewolf by Night, and the Man Thing. Um, and uh, and I'm thrilled. I'm really excited to uh, to be covering those. Uh, 
not quite successful, but yet glorious uh, things. I wish that they had been able to continue with it. It's interesting because the Marvel preview, I have not read. Uh, this will be a first time for me. Okay. But that Marvel premiere issue, yeah, I only read it as a kid. But what, what I remember of it, it is as batshit crazy as the Headman Nebulon saga from the Defenders. Yeah. And I know that you and I both own the T-shirt that has that Marvel premiere cover on it. Yes. Uh, so I think that we might have to post side-by-side -side images with the T-shirt. I think that's a great idea. Not that anybody wants to see that, <laughs> just to indulge our own amusement and, you know, childlike glee. You know, now we, we didn't get off on tangents the entire episode, and here we are at the end, and now we're going off on a tangent. Um, so as, as my readers know, uh, I am going to be applying for CBS's uh, Survivor reality show. Yep. Uh, of course, ND, you know, once you sign an NDA, you can't tell people if you made the cut or not. So you guys won't know unless I suddenly stop tweeting for 39 days. But uh, in in preparation for this, I'm going back and rewatching all 40 seasons because it's been on the air 20 years. There are 40 seasons of Survivor. Shit. And uh, one of my favorite players, the the high school physics teacher, Bob, who is 57 years old at, at the time of, of playing. Uh, he's running around with his shirt off and I'm like, all right, well, you know what? If Bob can run around with his shirt off on the Island, then I can do this. And that's the one qualm I had about appearing on the show was, was being shirtless at age 53. I, but, you know what? <laughs> if you want to go off on a tangent about, uh, you know, weird dysmorphia, I'm happy to have that conversation with you because I also do not, I don't want to be seen without my shirt ever. Uh, both because I'm uh, 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 blubbery, but also because I'm hairy. Uh, and the thing is, like, every time, you know, my wife is always like, honey, look around you at the people who are around you. Like, you know, you have to think, like, th these guys have their shirts off. <laughs> so, well, you know, if Bob you can do it, Brian, so can you. You know what? Props to your wife, and I'm not going to say her name on the air, but I, I adore her anyway, but I adore her for that because I, I will I will admit something to you, brother. Yeah. Um, I don't think you're blubbery at all. Do I think you are our friend Tim Levin? No, of course not. Neither one of us are Tim Levin. <laughs> uh, he worked very hard to get the body he has at our right. age. Uh, but you are in far better shape than I am. <laughs> well, but you're going to go kill yourself on Survivor. I'm not going to kill myself. I'm going to win. You know, I I think rather if you don't get into Survivor, I would like you to volunteer for Naked and Afraid. Okay. I think do you they should do, sign up for that. Do they do pair? I've never watched Naked and Afraid. Is it? Oh, is, Brian. Okay, folks, we really are on a tangent here. We won't keep you much longer. You can shut it off now if you want to. But Naked and Afraid is a glorious way to spend a like a uh, Sunday when they're marathoning it and it's raining outside and you like just want to shut down. They take two people who have varying degrees of experience in prepping or survival or whatever. Right. Uh, a, a man and a woman who've never met. Right. Um, they allow you to take one item. They bring you to a randomly selected dangerous place in the world somewhere, jungle, right. whatever it might be. Uh, and uh, you strip off your clothes and they do uh, blur out the genitals and, and women's breasts. Um, but butts are all over the place, sometimes for better, sometimes for worse. Right. Um, but it, it is, they just take you out there and basically you've got to just survive with, not much brought. So that's a Saturday afternoon for me. Where, where, where's the challenge coming? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but because you have to be there for like 21 days. Yeah. What do you win? Uh, I don't think you win anything. Oh, screw that. I'm going on Survivor then. I... <laughs> <laughs> well, if Survivor accepts you, but if they don't, I think you should go for the... I, I'm pretty sure it's 21 days. It might be... 21 days might be the the XL, the one with their teams, but right. uh, it might be 14 days, the regular one. I have to check, but basically it's like go out there and have to survive 
with whatever you can kill and, and or, you know, find or whatever and build yourself a shelter out of whatever's there. Right. Um, you should watch it. I think I, I think you will love it. I will have to check it out. I will, and I'm I'm not one um, for reality television, but I I like Survivor for for two reasons. Number one, because you know I am a bit of a survivalist, and yeah. number two, I love to people watch, and and there's no better people watching than Survivor. You know, so yeah. Well, if you if you prefer more people, you could watch uh, Naked and Afraid XL which is a longer process. And I believe in that case, they take, I think there are six men and six women uh, and they're, they're paired up in teams. Right. And of course the teams can then do whatever they want. They can abandon each other. They can betray each other. They can do whatever they think is going to let them survive. And again, like I probably have seen 20 episodes of this over the course of years. Yeah. Um, But when I have seen it, um, we were up in Maine at one point and we had a really rainy day. Uh, so everybody, we turned it on and it was, everyone just like, you know, conked out on the sofa and chairs and just like watched four episodes in a row that day because there was <laughs> nothing else to do. And it's fascinating. I don't, I also don't like reality shows generally, but there are some that I gravitate toward and I like that. And I like chopped for some reason on the, you know, uh, on the food channel. Uh, All right. Well, folks, there you have it. And, of course, that that whole rambling ending was, of course, once again brought to you by The Demon in the Glass by Matt Willison. (laughs) (laughs) This is why we don't have ads. (laughs) Exactly. Uh, But you know what we do have? We have Chris's signature send-off. Give it to us, Chris. Excelsior, true believer. We'll see you next week, folks, with the Legion of Monsters. Defenders Dialogue. You can listen to this episode and all previous episodes for free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play Music, and wherever else podcasts are available. Defenders Dialogue is written and produced by Brian Keene and Christopher Golden. Our theme music is by Xander Harris. Our engineer is Matt Wildeson. Check out his books on Amazon.com. 